liked about that. So my next guest is uh, Michael McInerney from uh, the BCS. From BCS. BCS. Yes. Okay. Welcome to the Cube. Business critical systems. Okay. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE.com. We're here in Las Vegas, Nevada, HP Discover 2011, where we're on the ground with theCUBE, our flagship telecast. We talk to the smartest guys around, executives, thought leaders, bloggers, anyone who wants, who wants to share their knowledge with us, we're going to have a conversation and go deep, expand those ideas. So, Michael, welcome to theCUBE. So, one, give me an Thanks. update on what's going on. We've had some of your folks in talking about some of the, some of the changes in, in, the, in the products. We had Intel on, talking about the chip. Okay. Uh, give us a quick update from your perspective on what's going on in your world today. Sure, no, um, so I'm responsible for building um, essentially the mission critical products at HP. So all of the servers, integrity based, um, and also some of the large scale x86 servers. So Ben, um, as you've been mentioning and talking about, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the effort has been, excuse me, has been around driving the, the converged infrastructure, driving the mission critical systems into converged infrastructure. So we, uh, so we've been investing a lot of time into that, so you'll see we have a common architecture from x86 all the way up through our sort of flagship Superdome, all built out on a common um, blade architecture. So our customers have a very seamless experience as they're deploying out their architectures, not get rid of this sort of islands of, of isolation in their data center. So a lot of people don't know this, but I actually worked at HP for nine years, from 1988 you Thank you. to 1997, and HP was an $8 billion company when I joined in the late 80s, and you know, they're, you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, 126 billion roughly revenue, uh, give or take a few tens of billions here and there. Um, so, they're known for high performance computing. It's yep. not a new DNA for HP. No, absolutely not, right? So we're out there running billions of credit cards, hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions on these mission critical systems. Um, stuff that you'd never see, but you know, how many, if you used your cell phone today, likely that you were actually touching one of our integrity systems, one of our high end, um, high availability systems. Um, so we continue to see that out. We see some interesting things happening out in some of the emerging economies where they're out trying to deploy this infrastructure that here in the US, we're sort of, we expect, like, we have credit cards, we have banking infrastructure, but we have customers coming to us and saying, you know, I need to go out and deploy 7,000 new banks over the next two years, you know, how do I do that? And we say, ah, <laughs> we have an idea, all right? Yeah, and so, yeah. you know, we have that sort of trusted mission critical architectures out there that we deliver in the marketplace. You know, obviously the press, I mean, mostly on the blog, blog side, which we do have a blog, but technically we're bloggers, we, we can consider press, but even on the mainstream press, they love to talk about the death of something, right? The death of, the, you know, sure. the death of the mainframe, death of the mini computer, death yes. of the LAN, death of client server. And so cloud brings in that conversation, the death of this. And you know, when we talked with yeah. Intel, they're like, oh, Intel's going to go down, Moore's Law, people of virtualization is going to kill Intel, yet they invest in cloud, their business is growing, it's a great investment, so the yep. world really never changes. It's kind of the same pattern and movie all the time, so we still have a need, even though there might be federated clouds and, and you know distributed network out there, it's still the same distributed network computing, yeah. and high performance computing still is a big part of that. So just for the folks out there that aren't on top of the whole you know, high end, I don't want to say mainframe class because the kind of mainframe is kind of old, but there is a uh, that high performance. It's kind of shrunk a little bit in size, but horsepower-wise, there's still that massive nodes out there of high performance, and that's not going to change. So just share the folks with the folks out there that dynamic. Yeah, I think there, there's two things that go on there, right? Is a lot of it is there's some very hardened infrastructure that's out there that's deployed, right? So if you're out there and you're you know, a large manufacturing company and you have an accounts receivable program that's out there and running and or a billing program that's out there from a telco that's out there providing your monthly uh, sell bill, uh, you know, what happens if that didn't work? Right, so well, that'd be a big problem, right? Collecting money is an important part of business. So a lot of these applications and these infrastructures have been hardened over time, and people just are not going to replace them. So those, the risk reward of going in there and saying, I'm going to change my billing application out because I think it'll be fun, um, isn't happening in the environment. So you continue to see that, and we continue to see customers looking at you know, where is it that, you know, I have my cloud-based architectures, I have my sort of more general purpose computing platforms, but there's some places in my enterprise that I still need better than general purpose, right? I still need that, so I can need higher levels of reliability. What's changing though? I mean, so we still have the need for high performance, so a lot of people on the cloud yes. side say, hey, there's an abundance of com compute. So we've done a lot about the storage, talked about three bar a year ago. Yep. Storage has always been, is now sexy in the middle of the conversation as a subsystem. 
but there's been a conversation that people have been saying, oh, we have an abundance of compute, and we just, the old grid argument, I don't know if yep. you remember those grid days, but, you know, I mean, is that true, is, a, is it uh, false, is it kind of true? Um, can I just no, it's a machines? great, I mean, it's a great question, right? So I think the idea here is, you know, what is performance? Right, so when we start talking about mission critical environments, what does performance mean to you? It was performance, so I'm a hardware guy, right? And so I want to talk yeah. about processors and cores and frequencies. But when you go out there and look in the mission critical environments, performance to those customers is not necessarily how many cores do I have, it's what's the response time on my application? How often do I need to tear down my application a year to upgrade things? How do I, how many unplanned failures do I have in my architecture? And this is where minutes matter, right? If I can't, if my billing application for texting goes down for a half hour, you know, how much money does it's a large telco dollars. lose? Those are real dollars. Real so, dollars. So the production, we talk about SAP with the software side, same thing. You've got production systems out there. Essentially, you know, how do you change the airplane out in midair, blah, 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 all that argument. But, you know, you're talking about computing. You're talking about mission critical. How, how do you guys fit that um, asset or capability into these new dynamic environments like cloud and big data? Absolutely. I think that, that cloud and big data are just great examples of of sort of an implementation, right? So I can go out and say, can I do these things on the cloud, right? Well, a lot of times for the mission critical pieces, these will be the last pieces you'll see sort of go out to the cloud, not because of the technology, but more because of the sensitivity of the information, right? If it's in healthcare, this is actually my, you know, my provider data or my, my customer data, I just can't share that. Financial services, telecommunications, this is my core data, this is my company. You know, I can do some of these things out in the cloud, but these other things I'm going to keep in. So you'll start seeing us talk about hybrid clouds and doing building clouds that are internal and external. Um, that'll definitely happen in this marketplace. And then the question just becomes is, do you have those mission critical clouds, right? Do you have the high availability? Do you have the scalability that you need within those cloud architectures? And, uh, and that'll be the interesting thing I think you'll see develop out there. We're here with Michael McNerney with uh, HP, runs the uh, group hardware for the big Superdome. I mean, this is the high-end performance computing with devices. Um, talking about all the things and why it's relevant to have all those high performance dedicated machines from HP. Um, kind of a philosophical question for you, Michael, around systems. You're a systems guy, I can imagine. You talk about, you know, you love cores, you love frequencies. So, you know, when you design a system, a motherboard or, or whatnot, there's a lot of engineering involved. And, you know, it's packaged up into a hardware machine. But now, we've been talking about the systems view, and Dave Donatelli and I were chatting about that, yes, on Monday night, around the cloud in a way is an operating system or its own system. It might not be encased in a machine, um, but there's system elements involved. So can you share with us the dynamics or kind of high level philosophy around architecture around how your machines, your hardware as a component of a new meta higher level system? Sure, it, it certainly has been true and I think you definitely, where do you find, define that layer of abstraction? Where do you define that layer of systemsness? When we look, look at the mission critical systems, this is what we're talking about, right? It's like, how do you build reliability in, not just at the CPU level? So my, my favorite story here is, um, with the integrity systems, we have un, what are they called? Um, unconsumed and consumed errors. So there's consumed errors in the processor. This means the, that a processor has a fault but it doesn't mean that the system fails because the rest of the system is able to sort of solve that. So the actual, the processor has failed, but the system hasn't failed. It's been able to back it out. It's been able to sort of either identify the application that that processor or that memory fault was associated with and kill just that process or something like that. So you see that sort of systems level things are built in, and this is really where we drive things. So if you look at like virtualization capabilities, having those tightly integrated into management so that then we can provision new servers, do capacity on demand. You know, I want to fail over a server, I want to move a bunch of workloads on it, I want to dynamically add capacity to that new server, I don't want to just have that sitting there. You know, how do you tie all these things together? How do you build out that system? That's really the key of what we work on. Talk about virtualization from your perspective. Obviously virtualization's been the heart of a lot of the conversations. Paul Moritz, who's you know, speaking, uh, I, I saw on Twitter actually, I, I think he's speaking here, um, talked at VMworld last year, we had theCUBE there, he said, first, first time in history, virtual machine server shipments <laughs> surpassed physical machines. So sure. that scares people, but it, it's a good technology advancement. Has virtualization helped your business on your end, or is it just you deal with it? 
so uh, two answers really, and, and this is maybe one is sort of just showing my age is, you know, <laughs> Unix systems have been virtualizing workloads since the beginning of time, right? We used to call this time sharing and now we moved into. Um, so virtualization is definitely sort of a live and well in the mission critical environment. A lot of things we do here is we will do things like electrically isolated partitions. So what this means is I have virtualized the system, I've sliced it up, and nothing that happens into the system down to you know you putting a bullet through it is going to impact the blade sitting next to it right it's completely electrically isolated so when we start talking about mission critical virtualization you start talking about this higher level how do we do things in a hardware level to guarantee complete isolation how do we partition the workloads versus sort of virtualizing with a hypervisor um, you know, that a lot of people can't take the performance hits on, I virtualized I.O., now all of a sudden there's this intermediary in my I.O. causing delays, I need raw performance on it my help, I.O. I, mean, I think you know, most people, I would say to the folks out there, it helps your business because it puts an emphasis on some of those mission critical virtualization. I guess, yes. I guess what I would say is, you guys are in essence in the mission critical business. Yes, whatever, absolutely. Whether it's virtualization or... Yeah, and or so there's this sort of no yeah. this notion of a hardened virtualization. What does it yeah. mean in a mission critical environment? And I've had customers sort of have that conversation with me where it's like, you know, what do you think of virtualization and a little bit of a broken English conversation and they're sort of like, no, 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 we want the Unix partitioning, we want these electrically isolated partitions, not just, you know, virtualization with the operating environment. You know, I've been watching us working at HP going back to the day, you know, actually met Bill and Dave when they were still alive in the late 80s when I joined the company when they first would uh, welcome guests. HP's storied history around HP UX and the servers, really even the old mini computer days, is legendary, and we all know that. But what's interesting that people might not know about is that HP is the really the only mini computer company to survive. You know, DEC, you know, kind of actually rolled into Compaq, which ended up ending up into HP. Data General went to EMC, and uh, so. You guys have transformed and reinvented yourself. That was helped with the some of the commodity server side of the business with Intel, sure. et cetera. So you guys have successfully always innovated on that. And when we talked to Intel, we asked them a question about their innovation challenges when uh, you know, a year or two years ago, and cloud was an early investment for them. So the question, and then it pay, it's been paying off for Intel. So my question for you is around investments. How are you, what are you guys investing in now that you see paying dividends down the road on the roadmap? So I think you know we continue to invest in um, you know it's not super exciting, right? It's continue to invest in availability, continue to invest in scalability. So the boring it, stuff that keeps the lights on and keep the lights money, on. And hardware, and yeah, yeah, and so yeah. people yeah. sort of oh, that's yeah, boring. we we yeah. sit around around in marketing meetings for a long time yeah. and come up with what's our value proposition, and it comes back to RAS like every time. And sometimes we re you know we change the letters around and try to create some new acronym. But ideally, it really is the scalability of the system. So today in the, this show, we're announcing. Thing. We're going to scale Superdome to 32 sockets, so we're going to take a, um, 16 sockets, essentially two chassis, wire them together, um, turn it into a 32 socket system. Um, you know, sort of really sort of upping that level of scalability. You'll see us continue to drive that. With Pulsen, we'll go up to like 256 cores on that system. You know, single image, image system, or as you mentioned, a lot of people partition that up into different workloads um, to drive that. So we'll see a lot of the scalability, a lot of the availability and then just keeping all of the virtualization capabilities and other pieces sort of built out. So what's the price tag for a 250 core machine, just ballpark or something? You know, I don't you know, know the number it, off the top of my head, it's not cheap. I mean, is it um, like, it's not 5,000, it's not 20,000. I mean, it's I, like, I mean, it's in the, it's big numbers. Right? It what's, is, absolutely. What solar system is it in? What, what I, I think the, I think it's- Hundreds of thousands? Hundreds of thousands of dollars, absolutely. And I think when you look at those costs, right, what's really interesting about that is, what is that compared to your total solution cost? So if you're talking about deploying a large scale SAP environment with you know, help from outside, um, essentially services, consulting, yep. you look at the software costs, you look at all these things, the actual hardware cost is fairly minimal in that equation. So a lot of times I think one of the conversations I have with people is, you know, how much does it cost for a Superdome? Well, how much does it cost you not to have a Superdome, right? Yeah. So what does it mean when your APO, it's SAP a big, APO it's a goes big down? It's purchase because of the mission critical. I just was going to get a, a feel for the for the device you know, component yeah. and see the services wrapped around it. And I think uh, you also have to look at what is the cost of building that equivalent architecture, right? So you sit there and say, I have Superdome, it means I have this cluster of servers built into this fabric. 
can I do that with an x86 environment? Can I take x86 boxes, put them together with, let's say, InfiniBan, cluster them, do all of these things, and put that whole package together? You know, what does that cost me? What does that cost me to actually operate and run? And I will tell you, we have those conversations with customers who are saying, I'm going to go build this out in this x86 architecture. And we say, OK, what is your sort of core value? Where are you want to invest as a company? Do you want to be a server vendor? or do you want to be a bank, right? And so Superdome can come in and build you a turnkey mission critical environment. And when you start looking at those costs, you start looking at the TCOs, you know, that will still come out on the positive side. And, and you're dealing with a very sophisticated, very savvy audience, because you've been selling to these environments. It's your standard big investment houses and sure. big companies, multinational companies, right? It's not like, you know, it's not SMB as everyone would think, hundreds of thousands of dollars. If they want to buy a Superdome, <laughs> we're going to sell them. <laughs> Law firm buys yeah. Superdome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, um, I guess my final question would be um, around where the action is right now. I'll see cloud big data, all the trends going on here. Yep. Where's the action for you guys in the marketplace and the use cases in particular? Because it, you know, it's a high-end machine, it fits into the architecture. You got the conversion networking group with all the Lego blocks from entry level all the way scaling up to the, yep. to the low end. We just had uh, Jeff Miller on from, uh, or Paul Miller on from the ESSN group talking about the you know, Lego blocks and appliances. What's the use case that, that's sexy right now or hot for you? I think you know, in, the, in the mission critical environment, what you tend to see is, you, know, you talk about big data, right? Adding all this extra data, having the ability to analyze and drive all of these data. A lot, mo in most enterprises, everything sort of always comes back to a couple of core systems, right? So you still can do a lot of analysis, you can still have a lot of opportunity but it's that core that you have to make sure is going to scale to meet this demand. That core has to be flexible. So how do I take my core data? How do I take my core business applications? That it's great to have these new capabilities like big data and being able to do analysis where you never could before, but a lot of times you're still going to be pinging on those core systems or still dependent on those core systems. And so as an IT manager, how do you make sure those aren't going to become the bottleneck, right? How am I going to make sure that core is going to scale when I need it to, expand when I need it to, um, to meet all these, these tremendous opportunities out there? So basically what there. you're saying is, no matter what the people talk about, the game is still the same. Whatever architectures they roll to, cloud, big data, core systems are at the heart of any infrastructure? I just think it, it's a, you, you want to make sure, for our customers, a lot of them are focused on, how do I make sure my core data doesn't become the bottleneck? Right, I can go out and yeah. do all of these things with big data and make all these things happen, but I still have to be able to get to customer, you know, these five facts about my customer in you know, sub millisecond time. Okay, how do I do that? And that's where they build out these mission critical architectures Final question, we'll let you go. Um, for Superdome and the super monster machines that you have there, horsepower uh, integrated in, what's the future for you guys? What, do you, what, are, what can people expect from Superdome and some of the new advances you guys are coming out? Sure, no, it's a great question. So again, you know, boring as heck, right? We're going to get bigger, we're going to get faster, um, we're going to get more Depends reliable. Who you talk to. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, this is what we do, this is what we eat for lunch, you know, breakfast and dinner, and, um, and that's what you're going to see from us is just continuing to drive that envelope. We think the mission critical requirements of today are going to pale to what we need to do to deliver that for 2020, so how do we keep building and, and driving that new, uh, that new limit? Okay. Okay, Michael McInerney, thanks for coming inside theCUBE, right. Superdome BCS, uh, the, the, uh, which stands for Business, Business Critical, critical systems. systems. There you go. Okay, thank you so much for All coming right. on theCUBE. Right. Really thank you so much. It. Thank you.